Hello and welcome to Bangalore International Center's very own podcast BIC Talks. Bangalore International Center is a platform for informed conversations, exchange of ideas and a space for arts and culture. BIC Talks brings the essence of all that the physical space stands for and more to your doorstep. Hi, I'm Pavan Srinath and welcome to BIC Talks. Today, it is my absolute pleasure to present to you the Scrolls and Leaves podcast by Mary Jose Abraham and Gayatri Vaidyanathan. This is a brand new, beautifully produced podcast made in collaboration with the archives at NCBS, the National Center for Biological Sciences here in Bangalore. The Scrolls and Leaves podcast features stories from the margins of history. This podcast makes its way through important global events from the past, but by using lesser known tales from history, science and culture from India and the global south. These stories might shock you or surprise you, but they remain relevant to this day. Scrolls and Leaves is also an audio experience with surround sound, so you may want to put your headphones on. Their first episode is titled Pandemics and Borders. Listen to tales of the defining pandemic of the 19th century, the COVID-19 of its time, cholera. Here is the first episode in full. Hi guy 3. Hi Meros. Shall we get started? Sure. Let's give a reminder to our listeners first. Um, please put on your headphones to hear this podcast in 3D. Okay, so this happens in April. There is a man in Noida, which is near Delhi, and he needs to buy medicines for his old parents. He goes to a pharmacy, but the guard won't let him in. The guard asks this guy to prove that he's not infected, else he can't buy medicine. The guard is adamant about it. He's drawn this little border, and the guy can't cross it without the proper papers, shall we say. So the guy just leaves without getting his medicine. All right, my turn. Here's a story from Wuhan, where it all started. This one was published in the California Sunday Magazine, and the journalist is Sean Yuan. Okay. So China's been assigning codes to people. Green for free moment. Yellow means a seven-day quarantine, and red means stay home for 14 days. And it's mandatory for everyone to have these codes. On March 22nd, a 35-year-old man named Wu leaves the hospital after recovering from COVID-19. He goes back home, and then he mostly just stays there. He doesn't go out. Why not? Is his code red? No, it's green. It's because of how he feels he's being treated by his neighbors. They avoid his family. Huh. And when his wife enters the elevator, everyone else huddles into a corner. It's like they're in a permanent isolation bubble. It feels like we're policing ourselves and our neighbors these days. Our governments are certainly tracking us. States keep closing borders and opening and closing them again. We stay at home, waiting for permission to leave. The Delhi Noida border and the Delhi Ghaziabad borders have now been sealed. I'm going straight across to my colleague, Rupashi Nanda. Officials are extremely concerned about the great public health consequences of mass uncontrolled cross-border movement. To move We're doing to a, a position pandemic. where a travel ban will be placed on all non-residents, non-Australian citizens coming to uh, Australia. The entire population is under virtual house arrest right now. The President, Emmanuel Macron, addressing the nation yesterday. And this is what he said. We are shutting down its borders, but this really does put New Zealand right up there in terms of putting that fence around the country to stop any international... Our lives feel a bit dystopian. And the question is, how did we get here to this moment? Why these responses? Okay, there is a simple answer and a complicated one. Okay, I'll take the simple one first. Well, it's partly because in 2005, most nations in the world agreed to count, track, trace and control each and every one of us during an international health emergency. Oh, like COVID-19? Yeah, 
And what's the complicated answer? Well, to really understand how these nations get to a point where they agree to such drastic action, we have to go back in time to another pandemic. Let's talk to some historians. Yes, I'm, I'm actually on my laptop. So I'm just dragging the, my laptop closer to me. Is that better? That's Pratik Chakrabarti. Yeah, the audio isn't much better, but he was in a lockdown and he didn't have a microphone. I work at the Center for History of Science, Technology and Medicine at the University of Manchester, UK. He says that 200 years ago, a pandemic broke out in India. It was the first real pandemic after the plague or the Black Death of the 14th century. And this outbreak redefined everything. Our notions of quarantine, of uh, trade, commerce, disease, and cholera you can almost read as a case study of modern pandemics. You know, it, it's a in- useful mirror to understand all subsequent modern pandemics by. What is this disease? Cholera. Everything goes back to 1817 when cholera broke out in Bengal. Welcome to Scrolls and Leaves. I'm Gayathri Vaidinathan. And I'm Mary Rose Abraham. This is episode one, Pandemics and Borders. There will be four chapters. Let's get started. Chapter one, Disease Knows No Borders. There are many kinds of borders, not just what you think of immediately. Even the masks we all wear is a border, trying to keep the germs out. A border can be anything from the board, the really critical, as we know now, border of the skin, the border of the human body. That's historian Alison Bashford at the University of New South Wales in Sydney. And what crosses that border as a microbe or what crosses that border as a needle that injects a vaccine, say. And as we look wider, the threshold of our front door, the borders around a town, even the crossover of a virus from forest to human settlements. And then uh, more in the 19th and t- especially the 20th century, uh, borders, disease borders often became coterminous with national borders. Um, and that's when you get in disease times a kind of a link between Um, keeping disease out and keeping out people. More than 200 years ago, disease took time to spread. It had to sail over oceans, clamber through jungles, trek across deserts. It traveled at the speed of caravans, stopped for tea at remote outposts, And often the weather would change or the local scenery would go from valley to mountain and the disease would die out there, all alone. It usually took ages, decades, sometimes centuries to get around the world. So things are plodding along until... The 19th century. Steamships replace sailboats and cut travel time significantly. Much of the global south falls to the Europeans. The British go from being traders to rulers of the Indian subcontinent. India was particularly important, particularly with the coming of colonialism from the uh, very end of the 15th century onwards. That's David Arnold. He's an expert on the history of medicine of South Asia and professor emeritus at Warwick University. He spoke to us from his country home in England. And what colonialism does is to introduce a whole new range of factors to that existing epidemiological situation. It introduces much more maritime trade. It introduces a new population of Europeans who had their own diseases or their own disease susceptibilities. It enhances links with Eastern and Southern Africa. It increases contact with Southeast Asia through to China. These were great conditions for a pandemic. Let's go back to 1817, to a town in Bengal. This is mostly nonfiction. It's based on historical records from our storyteller, Sumit Kumar. It's been raining since January. The heat has been churning up the swamps and the vapor hangs heavy. Robert Titler, a British surgeon in Jessore, 
has been expecting an outbreak. Still, he is unprepared for 19th August. A native doctor or Vedya knocks on his door. Something's wrong in the bazaar, the Vedya says. The bazaar is the Indian part of town. It's two miles long, next to Bhairab River. Across the river is a swamp. It's so congested, people are selling food from their doorways and Titler finds the smell unpleasant. The huts are narrow as can be, dark and damp inside. The Vedya takes Titler to a hut. A man is lying on a mat on the ground. He's middle-aged. His friends are pouring water into his mouth. Titer gets closer and sees his face is pale. His forehead beaded with sweat. His eyelids are half closed. And Titer pulls him up and sees lifeless eyes. His body feels frigid. His pulse is weak. He was fine yesterday, the Vedya says. Then during the night, he collapsed in pain. He had diarrhea, vomiting and he, he kept begging for water. Titler is shaken. This seems like cholera. The next day, the man dies. And within two days, 17 people die in the bazaar. That year in Calcutta, funeral pyres burned continuously at the ghats leading from Chitpur Road to the Hooghly River. When there's no more fuel for cremation, bodies are thrown into the river. And in time, there are so many floating corpses that they entangle with the shipping cables. The stench is unbearable and the magistrates pay Muslim men to clear the bodies. Cholera is unpredictable. Sometimes it claims an entire village and spares the next one. It disappears and then reappears months later. The only sure thing is that death, when it comes, is swift and painful. From Jeshur, it marches on with British troops. It marches across the subcontinent to Jaffna in 1818. It hops on the frigate Topaz and sails to Mauritius, Onward to Madagascar, Sumatra, Penang. Russia in 1823, Persia and Turkey in 1828, across the Baltic Sea into England and Ireland in 1831, and then the Americas in 1833. Six waves of cholera shake the world by the end of the 19th century. Tens of millions of people die globally, at least 10 million in India alone. Chapter 2, Us and Them In the 1830s and 40s, people think that cholera is transmitted by clouds of toxic air, called miasmas, spewed by India's very soils. Europeans name the disease Asiatic cholera or Indian cholera, and that is a problem. Why? I mean, didn't we just say cholera came from Jeshur in Bengal? Uh, no, what I meant was the first record of the 1817 outbreak is from Jeshur. Cholera is much older than that. There are historical mentions of localized outbreaks from around the world. But in 1817, the disease went global. I often joke with my students that it, I feel kinship with cholera because it's the most successful South Asian immigrant. That's Projit Mukherjee, a historian at the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia. He doesn't like it when people say cholera came from South Asia. There's a lot of problem with that narrative. People say cholera is from Bengal because there are old Hindu goddesses dedicated to cholera, or they point to mentions in ancient Ayurvedic texts. Sounds like rather flimsy evidence. Exactly. Projit says the cholera gods are newish and created by people desperate for a divine cure. And the Ayurveda texts? They only mention symptoms, diarrhea, fatigue, dehydration. But those can fit many diseases. Historians of medicine call this retrodiagnosis, when you take a contemporary cluster of symptoms and try to back project it and find other references where it crops up, and you ignore everything else. 
What is more important is to think of why, and this is, I think, what you were hinting at, of why is there even this pressure to try and find a point zero and to call it Asiatic cholera and say it came from there. And there's a whole politics to that happening. And that was very much to do with a lot of 19th century racism. And in fact, like if you look at the racism, it's not always to do with South Asia. If you look at cholera globally, and cholera in many ways is the quintessential global disease because it starts off at a period when global travel and contact is being intensified and speeded up. So it spreads very quickly. It appears global. But in every place you see it in, across the world, it often gets associated with other communities. Think about the connotations of cholera even today. No, the connotations of most infectious diseases. They seem to belong to the poor world, to Kolkata or Lagos. It's 1849. London is reeling from the third cholera pandemic. A doctor named John Snow tracks down cholera patients, and with some detective work, he connects their disease to a water pump on Broad Street. The water is contaminated by sewage. It's the first hint that just maybe cholera is caused by more than clouds of toxic air. It's after this point that the state's role in healthcare changes. Projit says that before this, doctors were saying, give poor people more food, help them live well in clean housing so they can fight off contagions, improve their socioeconomic conditions. But that all gets sidelined because once you have this waterborne vector theory, public health becomes about, you know, policing contact and about building certain kinds of infrastructure and guarding access to it. That's drastic. Here's an example of how health becomes about borders. Indians are poor under colonial rule. Many are in cities that have no water, no sanitation. The quarters are filthy and crowded. The lowest castes and the lowest classes have it the worst. The European colonizers are terrified they will catch diseases from Indians, so they draw a border around themselves. They set up white towns. White towns? Seriously? Yeah, and the Indian quarters were called black towns. I spoke about this to Tharangani Sri Raman, a historian from Azim Premji University in Bangalore. It was important to, to ensure that there was not too much coming and going of Indians into the white town, except, of course, to ensure that there's enough of menial services that are made available. So so that's uh, the white town for you. It sounds like a, like a modern gated community in India. <laughs> it does. It uh, definitely does. As policymakers in the West realize that cleanliness and sanitation are key to stopping cholera, they install piped water in London, Paris, New York, but in India... There's a divergent history of what the British did to protect Indian cities to improve sanitary conditions in the Indian cities. That's Pratik Chakraborty. We met him earlier. So what they do? He says they build a dual system of sanitation in the colonies. In Calcutta, which was the capital of British India, they install one water supply where river water is filtered and passed to White Town. And a second water supply, which is unfiltered water, goes to the Black Town. And that dual system exists to this day in Kolkata. That's incredible. Does it work to stop cholera, this dual system? Sort of. Wherever sanitation and filtered water are installed, cholera rates decline. But elsewhere, not really. How do they justify their actions? In so many ways. But the one that bugs me the most? They imply that cholera belongs in India, and to Indians, and to the poor, in a way that it doesn't belong in Europeans. Chapter 3. Where there's a border, there's police. The thing that really cements the link between public health, borders, and policing is science. Beginning in 1851, Europeans host these massive conferences on sanitation. Both scientists and diplomats attend, and the tone is unabashedly racist. Many times they compare themselves to the Roman Empire and Christian crusaders out to civilize and clean up the East. Ten of these conferences are held by the end of the century, and eight focus on cholera. Eight? Yes. Let me tell you about the third one. 
It's 1865, and Europe is reeling from the fourth cholera pandemic. This one began in the Ganges Delta, caught a ride on Hajj pilgrims traveling from India to Mecca, and from there to Egypt and Europe. People are dying by the hundreds of thousands. France calls for the Third International Sanitary Conference. It's held in Constantinople, the jewel of the Ottoman Empire, and the threshold between the East and the West. On February 13, 1866, representatives from 18 mostly European nations get together. And the French delegate, Dr. Favel, he is sort of metaphorically speaking, points his finger East. That is where the disease is coming from. The conference goes on for seven months and 13 days, 44 sessions. That sounds like a conference from hell. Yes. One committee discusses the Indian problem. Pray tell, what is the Indian problem? Well, the Italian delegate says it best. We have to stop that cursed traveler who lives in India, everyone knows it, from taking his trips. At least we have to stop its progress as closely as possible to its departure point. That's incredible. Is he talking about the Hajj pilgrims? Exactly. Here's Projit. So pilgrimages become like the Kumbh Mela at Hardwar or the Hajj to Mecca become a major site where the state really starts intervening in unprecedented ways to control mobility. And so there are all kinds of ways in which we actually see in India what the world is going to see later in the 19th century, throughout the 1800s, that is, of this gradual kind of development of new powers of state intervention, which have which put this the interest of stopping infection above and beyond any kind of respect for civil liberties. Here's Sumit, our storyteller. This time he is in Hardwar in 1867, with a story based on research done by historian Catherine Pryor. It's 1867. One year after the Third Sanitation Conference. H.T. Robertson, a British official, is preparing for the Kumbh Mela in Hardwar. The spot is on the Ganges where it exits the Himalayan foothills. Hundreds of thousands of pilgrims are expected in April. They will bathe in the river to rid themselves of bad karma. Robertson meticulously plans the sanitation. He charges a tax on the pilgrims and traders to pay for upgrades. He doesn't want a cholera outbreak on his watch. His men dig trench latrines near the main camp. It stinks. There's little privacy. And his men patrol the jungles and the riverbank to drive out anyone trying to relieve themselves there. Some women do not go to toilet for two or three days. Despite the measures, 19 people die of cholera. And as the pilgrims head back home, they leave a trail of disease. The Brits are frantic. They stop pilgrims at rail stations and bridges to examine them for symptoms. The pilgrims are made to bypass large towns. Some have to walk miles in the heat through heavy sand without any food or water. Some die from the journey. Officers also quarantine some pilgrims for two to five days before they can enter their hometown. If a person dies from cholera, they quickly burn his body and possessions. Despite all this, a quarter of a million Indians are infected within months. Half of them die. It's the first outbreak of this size at Hardwar. The pilgrims blame the interference of the Brits. And they are not wrong. An inquiry finds that Robertson men buried the excrement from the trench latrines in the porous riverbank right next to the Ganges. The ground must have impregnated with sewage. It must have contaminated the Ganges where the people were bathing. That's one account of the use of policing for public health reasons. Borders are defined and enforced, 
between pilgrims and the others, towns and outside towns, between the clean and unclean. Pilgrims become objects of surveillance. Fast forward to 1883. A German scientist named Robert Koch shows once and for all that cholera is caused by a bacterium and transmitted by dirty water. But rather than fixing sanitation in their colonies, Europeans insist that the solution to cholera is to keep Indians away. Or put another way, rather than improving public health, they choose to police, and they require the quarantine of all Hajj pilgrims to Mecca. We've been poring over historical research on pilgrimages, and based on work by historian Saurabh Mishra, here's a story of what a Muslim pilgrim setting off for the Hajj in 1885 can expect to go through. I've been saving for Mecca for years. My journey began near Hyderabad and I travelled by rail and bullock carts to the big city, Bombay. I went straight to a Hajj broker. These men are swindlers, but I was careful. I bought a ticket. There was a departure date, but these ships don't leave until they are full. I stayed at a friend's chawl near Thakurdwar, and every day I went to the port to check on the ship. Before departure, I went to the medical camp where some men inspected me for disease. They doused my bag in steam and gave me papers. I also got a pilgrim passport. On departure day, the port was madness. Policemen were hitting people with their batons. The pilgrim swelled abroad on three gangways not looking back. We were all dreaming of Mecca. The crowd carried me up to the ship down a hatchway. I found a small space inside the ship. The steamship set off for Khamran Island, a barren land in the Red Sea. Hell on earth! A quarantine station. I heard the Ottomans run it. I was exhausted from my month-long journey, from the stench of people and excrement and the lack of food. I was shoved into a dinghy and rowed to the island. Attendants grabbed me and steamed my luggage. They pushed me into a hut where I have to stay with 60 other pilgrims for 10 days. The heat is suffocating. I have only 11 square feet to myself. And I have to pay for this confinement, for the overpriced food. I am here, but I am afraid. If cholera occurs in this group, we will be trapped in Khamran for weeks. The disease will run through this crowd. I may even miss Mecca. Kamaran has a terrible reputation. One Indian who does this pilgrimage wrote this poem. Mid Jeddah and Aden way, the quarantine at Kamaran lay. The hajis of the Indian land are first tried on this sand. And if one can save his life here, in going to Hajj, he has no fear. Who does not die in ten days, good luck he has in all his ways. Oh, for the sake of quarantine! Thy God's prisoners, all of us have been. All this stuff that we think are like what modern states do is actually developed in places like India because these are like the laboratories of modernity. And so because in Europe, there are other concerns about things like civil liberties, which they don't care about in the colonies. They can push people around no end. Projit says the place where these restrictions most clearly play out today is in our airports. The surveillance tools of the 19th century, the pilgrim passports, the bills of health, live on in our passports, our visas. Many countries today require proof that you have certain vaccinations, such as yellow fever, before you can enter. And there is usually a customs officer at the border who goes through your documents with the goal of enforcing who's coming in and who's going out, noting down who crosses the border. 
These measures are familiar to anyone from the developing world who's waited in airports to enter Europe or North America. I mean, here's a great example. When Alison Bashford hosted a conference in Sydney, she found that people from developing nations kept dropping out. As if to prove a point, it was a conference on medicine and borders. I can remember it was, first of all, it was someone from Afghanistan, then it was someone from Pakistan, and then it was someone from Chile, if I remember correctly. And then there started to be a Global South pattern of people who were pulling out of my global conference on called Medicine at the Border. And I thought, what, what, what is going on here? Is this something as mundane as um, funding, in which case I can try and fix that? It turned out that people from some parts of the world had to jump through many biosecurity hurdles. They had to prove they were not diseased. For example, the scientist from Afghanistan had to prove he didn't have tuberculosis. And getting all that paperwork was a hassle. The demographic of my conference, ironically, in the, glo- in the South, Sydney, ended up being almost all uh, Europeans and North Americans. Chapter 4, Assassination The draconian measures begin with cholera, but it's another disease, plague, that makes the Brits go all out. That's when the state breaches the ultimate border of our bodies. In 1896, bubonic plague enters Bombay, carried by rats that hitch a ride on ships from Hong Kong. The city is already devastated. Cholera is always there, and so is famine. People are malnourished and weak, prone to disease. The colonizers are terrified of the plague. They passed the Epidemic Diseases Act in India in 1897. Historian David Arnold calls it a ruthless law. It gave the government the power to intervene in almost every aspect of the population's life. And particularly, they're targeting here the Indian population, the Indian population living in the slums and tenements of Bombay, of Calcutta and other big cities. Soldiers throw people out of their homes. They burn down buildings. The authorities issue plague passports, which are pieces of paper permitting the bearers to leave their home for essential work. Rumours start going around that doctors are carving the hearts out of plague victims and sending them to Queen Victoria. People pack up and leave in droves. Walter Charles Rand is the special plague officer in Pune, and quite frankly, he seems like a despot. He sends soldiers into people's homes. Darangini Sriraman says this is unprecedented. Imagine these white men, these men in uniform, these soldiers just going into these houses and uninvited. They have no invitation to go come here, but they they just enter these houses. And the soldiers, all men, approach women and ask them to disrobe so they can examine their armpits and their groins for plague, which causes these swollen bumps. That is an assault. Here's a nonfiction story from those turbulent times. It's 1897. The Chapeku brothers are angry. Soldiers are entering temples, disrespecting women, breaking idols and burning holy books. Walter Charles Rand is responsible for all this. Damodar Chapikar is the eldest. He procures a revolver. It's faulty. Only one barrel out of five works, but it'll do. He also gets a pistol. And the brothers watch Rand. They decide to strike on June 22nd. It's the day of Queen Victoria's Diamond Jubilee at the government house in Pune. There will be a state banquet and a reception, followed by bonfires and fireworks. That evening, the tree-lined avenue leading to the government house is packed. Police are everywhere. Damodar waits outside the gates, watching the carriages leaving the banquet in the light of the lamps. At 11 p.m., he spots Rand's carriage and coachman. He runs behind him towards his brother Balakrishna, who's waiting near a yellow bungalow. Damodar shouts, a signal telling Balakrishna, it's on. Damodar pulls open the window at the back of carriage, puts the revolver close to Rand's back and fires. 
Balakrishna fired at the second carriage that is following Rand. So what happens to them? Rand and the other officer die. The Chapaker brothers are hanged. And that plague law? You mean the Epidemic Diseases Act? Yeah. It's still with us. Hmm. The Indian government enacted it for the coronavirus pandemic. Hmm. You know what's equally troubling? Those international sanitary conferences from the 19th century, those are with us too. They led to something called the International Health Regulations. These are rules created by the World Health Organization in 1969, and they dictate how the member nations should act when there's a global health emergency. Wait, isn't that the thing you mentioned when we first started talking about pandemics and borders, the reason why Mm -hmm. countries act the way they do? Yeah, yeah. Wow, those are still in place. Yeah, and in fact, in 2005, the World Health Organization rewrote the regulations to make surveillance an even more central part of public health. Let's talk to Martin French. He's a sociologist and surveillance expert at Concordia University in Montreal. Many states, especially in so-called low-resource areas, would you know, be better served by investing in more fundamental components of public health than they would by spending money on trying to create surveillance systems. He says this focus on surveillance can be seen as a way to contain, I suppose, contain infectious disease in poor areas, uh, giving wealthy states the capacity to quickly act to protect themselves by closing borders and so on. I think this critique, we could trace this critique and we could trace in some senses the containment logics of the international health regulations and of the global public health system to multiple origin points, but one of these origin points would certainly be European colonialism. So the events of the 19th century are still with us in so many ways. They are the building blocks of our response to COVID-19, to Ebola before this, to Zika, SARS. Our actions have been so drastic. Lockdowns, surveillance... We're already sort of seeing the normalization of a lot of kinds of surveillance that, you know, prior to COVID-19 would have been unthinkable. Even people who generally care about privacy are begging the state to step in and track everyone. The police may not be barging into our homes, but we have apps for that now. As for cholera, the main character of this story, it's still around. It cropped up in May in Yemen, Mozambique and Zimbabwe in 2018, Niger, Iraq, Pakistan, in Haiti. In pockets with unclean water, where people are poor, where there is strife and little governance. A grim reminder that we have failed in our collective responsibility of ensuring public health for all. Thanks for listening. I'm Gayathri Vaidinathan. I'm Mary Rose Abraham. Our sound maestro is... Nikhil Nagaraj. The storyteller is Sumit Kumar. You are listening to Scrolls and Leaves in collaboration with the archives at the National Center for Biological Sciences. Our thanks to David Arnold, Alison Bashford, Pratik Chakrabarti, Martin French, Sanjeev Jain, Projit Mukherjee, and Tarangini Sri Raman. Thanks to our episode supporters, India Bioscience and DBT Wellcome Trust India Alliance. Visit scrollsandleaves.com for episode notes, extended interviews with our experts, and to discuss. We're listening. And of course, please subscribe on your favorite podcast platform and spread the word. Our next episode is on traditional remedies. Hope you enjoyed the first episode of Scrolls and Leaves. My thanks to the hosts and to the archives at NCBS for allowing us to rebroadcast this treat of an episode. Visit scrollsandleaves.com or subscribe to the podcast on your favorite podcast app to not miss out on future episodes. Here on BIC Talks, we'll resume our original programming from the coming week. Thank you and don't forget to subscribe to BIC Talks as well if you haven't and keep tuning in. Thank you for listening in till the end. Please share this episode with a friend on social media, WhatsApp or anywhere else. It would mean the world to us. And in case you're listening via iTunes or Apple Podcasts, please leave us a rating and a review.
Subscribe to BIC Talks on email or your favorite podcast app and don't miss out on future episodes. This episode of BIC Talks has Gaurav Krishna as our sound engineer with support from S Sarvanaraj and Lekha Naidu. And the accompanying episode artwork was made by Channi Venkataraman. Thank you for listening to this episode of BIC Talks. This podcast can be accessed on our website bangaloreinternationalcenter.org as well as on any of your favorite podcast platforms. Tune in for new episodes every week and do subscribe to our YouTube channel and follow our Facebook, Twitter and Instagram pages to stay informed on our latest updates. Thank you.